So let's now start at the beginning and talk a little bit about background. The GI generation. The, the word GI, by the way, literally means government issue or general issue. It was stenciled on their backpacks when, it, when they went off to World War II. And when we think of the GIs, I think what comes to mind a lot of you is uh, the, the book by Tom Brokaw, The Greatest Generation, right? The great, great for the great wars they won and the great institutions they built and they poured more concrete than any other generation, you know, the dams and the interstates and, you know, just they were a builder generation, obviously. One question, though, that rarely gets asked and should, I think should interest all of you as educators is not the question of what did they build, but who built them? Where did they come from anyway? And it's fascinating because if you go back in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, you will find that GIs as little children were fussed over by protective parents and communities who were as eager to raise up a new generation as good as the previous generation everyone agreed was hopelessly bad. They were called the lost, they later became known as the lost generation. They had high rates of suicide, juvenile delinquency, everyone was talking about that. Crime rate was high, drug abuse was rampant among youth at that time. It was totally unregulated at that time. I'm sure a lot of you are aware that in 1900, Coca-Cola had the real thing, right? Uh, that changed. That changed with the GIs. We had the Harrison Act, keep drugs away from kids. We had, ultimately, we had prohibition to keep alcohol away from family life. We had child labor laws to keep these kids out of dangerous uh, work situations. Vitamin pills and pasteurized milk and packaged foods and all kinds of special things for these little GIs. For the first time in American history, we wanted to see little kids in uniform. Never happened before, but suddenly we had the birth of Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, fire, you know, Campfire Girls, 4-H clubs, that all started right around 1912, 1913. Um, in the early 1920s, these became the first Miss Americas. And they, during the mid-1920s, the mood started changing on college campuses, this new mood of optimism and cooperation, you know, replacing the sort of F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway uh, mood. And then they, what did they do come the Great Depression? Well, they voted hugely for the Democratic Party. Uh, and they, they, many of them got their uh, first jobs with government. They became the CCC dam builders and tree planters. They, uh, they were the heroes of World War II. They, they became the most uniformed generation per capita in American history, bar none. And when they came home from the war, what did they do? They just kept on building, right? So you got the, the suburbs and the, the highways and the miracle vaccines. And finally, as midlife leaders, they gave us model cities, the Great Society, Apollo Moon Launch Program, and they, when it got into, in, they got into really loud arguments with their boomer kids who were born after the war. They're boomer kids who didn't understand the moral purpose of just constantly making institutions bigger and stronger. What's the point of that? Is it good for us to do that, right? The boomers asked these questions, and GI said, I don't know, we were just programmed to do this, you know, it seems like a much better world to us, but, uh, you know, you tell us. Um, but it's interesting that this generation has so many, so many fundamental traits which we associate with from, from, from youth to old age, that optimism, somewhere over the rainbow. John Kennedy came to the presidency with, let's get this country moving again. Ronald Reagan, you're right, even in his second term, mourning again in America. You know, the GIs, everything was looking up. You can always, like, Work to get something done, right? Um, what, about their, what about their association with citizenship? All of their lives, they define the most, the highest voting age bracket, no matter which age they've been. When they were young, we thought of them as junior citizens. Older people are amazed at their civic habits. And now that they're old, well, in 1965, when this generation started retiring, we invented a new word to describe old people, senior citizens. We never called the old people senior citizens before this generation became old. We just called them old people. <laughs> no. they, they went to nursing homes, not to plan care communities, you know, but very different. And, and of course, as soon as that happened, we, we voted in, you know, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. We gave them huge community rewards for a lifetime of community service, just like the GI Bill, child labor laws, everything else. So they've had this incredible connection with civic action and, and reward uh, that other generations have not shared. 
Generational surprise, certainly in their youth, and that's my theme here, is how every generation in their youth comes along as a surprise. Well, they changed high schools in the early 1920s, and that's a huge period of building, both of high schools and colleges. A lot of the Rose Bowls and these huge stadiums that you see around the country are, were all built in the 20s. Uh, impact on education, well, I talk about they helped build the system because the boomers think the system is a big deal. Uh, the system didn't exist before GIs came along. In fact, after World War II, a homeowning, uh, union card holding middle class, uh, which the GIs created, did not exist before the GIs came along. So, of course, the GIs were very proud of what they were able to invent. But it was also an era of historic reform and achievement gains. This generation uh, uh, constituted the biggest single generation improvement in American history in educational achievement from an average of 8 to 11 years of education from first cohort 15 percent with high school diplomas to 50 percent by the last cohort, you know, the, the George Bush uh, senior cohort. Uh, so an amazing, uh, they were, by the way, they were also physically larger because of all those dietary improvements in school. They had the single generation largest increase in adult stature, or nearly two inches. So all those WPA murals, you know, showing these big burly guys, they really were big, you know. Uh, and I'm sure older people saw them that way. To GIs, a high school diploma is valued, necessary, and usually sufficient. Of course, they invented the ubiquitous. They invented the standard uh, of the high school diploma, and they were very proud of it. And they also invented a middle class in which a high school diploma could basically was your ticket of entree into a middle class, which was very strong, and incomes which were increasingly equal uh, during the late 1950s, 1960s. Well, what about the next generation, the silent generation? Well, the silent were the children of crisis, right? They were growing up when there was a depression going on, a war going on, and the style of child rearing was becoming more protective for the GI's approach to, the approach to suffocation. When you think of people in the media, silent kids in the the media, who do you think of? Maybe the Little Rascals, Shirley Temple, right? Good kids, tight envelope of protection. And when they started entering adulthood right after World War II, they surprised older people. Because unlike the GIs, they didn't want to join the Communist Party or change the form of government or conquer half the world or do these huge aggressive things. Instead, their motto was, we don't want to change the system, we want to work within the system. Uh, Fortune magazine actually had a cover story in 1949 called The College Class of 49, and the subtitle was Taking No Chances. They found that on job interviews, their first questions were about pension plans, you know. Um, and not only did they, did they want to have careers at an early age, you know, the 30-year defined benefit pension and all this stuff, the invisible handshake, I'll be with you forever, all of that. They did that at a very early age. They also got married and had kids earlier on average than any other generation in our history because of the prosperity of the economy enabled it and because they were looking for security. <clears throat> uh, very interesting. They actually got the name. William Manchester, the historian, gave them the name Silent in the early 1950s because they kept their heads down during the McCarthy era. Well, all these GIs were going after each other's reputation for who was, was or was not a communist in the early 30s. There was no word from undergraduates on campus. They didn't want anything to go in their permanent record, you know. So is that anyway? Um, fascinating generation. Uh, normally, when we're not just looking at youth, I talk about what happened to them for the rest of their lives. It's fascinating with the silent. Economically, they've done very well. Upwardly mobile. Uh, economically, they've been more fortunate almost than any other generation in the 20th century. Um, you know, they bought those houses. Uh, with the 2% mortgages just before inflation hit. They're relatively small, so we're not going to have to cut their Social Security and Medicare. Many of the silent are getting these silent, uh, they're getting these golden parachutes, right? And they've been retiring in the 1990s. Uh, Woody Allen has this expression, 80% of life is just showing up, right? <laughs> so it's interesting. I, I don't know any Xer who believes that about, you know, about one's economic fortune in life. Okay, that's t utterly alien expression. That doesn't resonate at all with the Gen Xer. Um, but they've had to pay the price for some of that early conformity. This was the generation that by the 1970s uh, invented the midlife crisis, right? Gail Shi, think about it. Gail Shi and all the big writers who wrote about this were from the silent generation, changing jobs, changing careers, changing spouses. This was the generation that was the 
opening wedge of the divorce revolution and has given them a very interesting life cycle, more experimental as they've grown older. They've had a wonderful reputation for, um, well, they brought us civil rights, rock and roll. They brought us so many good things. Um, but they've always had a reputation for complexity and process, 17-point flow charts and all that. They've multiplied committees in every institution they've taken over. I don't know if you've seen the Iraq Study Group report, which almost entirely silent membership, you know, with Edwin Meese and James Baker III and all those guys. Take a look at the Iraq Study Group report. You know how many recommendations it has? 69 recommendations. What do you do with a report with 69 re I often, when I have a bunch of Xers in the audience, I say, how many recommendations, if you Xers had an Iraq Study Group report, how many recommendations would it have? And they all say, well, you know, I don't know what it would be, right? I don't know what the recommend, but it would be one recommendation, something you can act on, right? Something, some bottom line accountability. But this is typical of the silent. And it may be one reason why the silent may become the first generation in American history never to occupy the White House. This is amazing, isn't it? We've totally leapfrogged them. We went from a World War II veteran to a post-war boomer, namely from Bush Sr. to Clinton. John McCain is their last chance. Okay, that's it for them, I think. I don't know. I, I, I think that's it. I don't, see th I don't see them coming back after that. Uh, generational surprise, the silent changed schools in the late 40s. That's when people began to notice this, this, this new kind of kid um, a strangely unadventurous, risk averse, uh, wanting to fit in, uh, all of the mobilization after World War II to take care of the, the you know, youth violence that might occur, none of that happened. Impact on education, we inherited the system in an age of broad business, labor, voter consensus on education. It was amazing how in the 1950s everyone thought the kids were really smart and well behaved. Their biggest problems were gum chewing or cutting in line. Um, and because everyone figured, we finally figured out how to educate kids, you know, the, the comprehensive high school, the only task was scaling it up, just making them bigger. So by the time boomers came along, everything was bigger. The districts were bigger, the high schools were much bigger, and we, we're going to see how that turned out. <laughs> um, but anyway, everyone thought we had, uh, we had solved the problem. To silent a high school diploma is still valued and necessary, but no longer sufficient. More of this generation wanted to go into post-secondary education. They became accountants and doctors and lawyers and psychotherapists and various things, as we know, that the GIs never really thought about. Okay, what about boomers? By 1943 to 1960, by that definition, how many boomers in this room? Wow. Okay, we have a mono-generational audience in here. <laughs> You've been so well behaved. I'm, <laughs> I'm thankful now. Um, uh, well, the, the boomers know who they are. It's been highlighted by the media ever since they were born. It's as though no phase of life means anything until boomers have experienced it and can tell other generations all about it. Isn't that right? <laughs> they came along as the feed-on-demand Dr. Spock babies just after World War II. These were the indulged beaver cleavers of the 50s and the, the screaming long-haired radicals and, and, uh, and Vietnam grunts of the 60s, the inner-city rioters of the 1960s. Every, every decade has an icon. Uh, the Forrest Gumps of the 1970s looking for their runner's tie. Maybe the, uh, the famous yuppie of the early 1980s. Remember that? Suddenly into family values, cocooning. Uh, and into a very severe definition of their career that was often unrelated to, the, to, to whatever establishment they worked for. You know, they defined it themselves. They were going to take charge of their own careers. Um, a couple, of, a couple of traits about boomers are just extremely important to understanding this generation, uh, two of them in particular, which really have defined their entire lives. One of them is their individualism. That is actually uh, what Cheryl Mercer calls the, the master trend for baby boomers, their sense of self-sufficiency. They really don't need institutions. They don't need anyone. And certainly there's a big difference among women in this generation, the first generation of women who believe that economically they really can be self-sufficient and have that expectation. Um, Robert Putnam, the sociologist, wrote a book not too long ago called Bowling Alone. It's a huge tome. I won't, you know, wouldn't ask you to actually read this thing. It's that big. He, he asked the question, why do we bowl alone? You know, we used to bowl. We go bowling. We went with a group. We went with the Elks Club, right, or something. Now we just go alone. What created, what trend, what caused this incredible 
individuation of our society. And he examined every cause, TV, everything. And he finally comes to the conclusion, it's two-thirds of it is just generational replacement. It's not that anyone changed. It's just that older generations, which are taught to do things in groups even when they were young, are aging out. And younger generations, starting with boomers and exers following them, are taking their place. That's what's causing this that's what's causing this shift. It's a generational shift. The other master trend for boomers is their values orientation. You ever notice that? When in the late 1960s, almost anything written about values in America was about college students. The, the values of our youth. Everyone was talking about that. Apparently, older people didn't have any values. <laughs> it was the values of our youth. And we, this greening of America and consciousness three, and we lowered the voting age to take advantage of their wisdom and all that. Today, almost anything written about values is about people in their 50s. It's culture wars. It's red zone, blue zone. It's basically still boom on boom. Isn't it amazing that boomers are always telling other generations what's good, what's valued, what's real, what's authentic? 30 years ago, boomers didn't trust anyone over 30. Today, they want to police the morals of everyone under 30. <laughs> or as... Um, As someone told me recently, the same generation that once took recreational drugs to think outside the box, today gives its own kids drugs to behave inside the box, right? <laughs> but that's not hypocrisy for boomers. That's just maturing to a greater sense of wisdom. <laughs> and the silent generation might have had midlife crisis, right? But, in, but, in, but boomers in midlife just get wiser. You know, that's, that's how we define our midlife. Um, interesting headlines for boomers. Think about how they've affected, right, the, the, even the commercial culture, right? That's the kind of, uh, oh, yes, how do we expect boomers to grow old? Well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting that the GI generation, <laughs> you notice that the GI generation uh, the GI generation has always been very powerful in politics and the economy. The AARP is still a huge, powerful lobby in Washington to protect their interests. And we still ask, you know, Henry Kissinger what he thinks when this country has a crisis. But think of anything the GIs have done in the culture in the past 20 or 30, 40 years. A novel, a song, anything? No, they're invisible. Boomers, their old ages could be just the opposite. No one's going to call them senior citizens. Any. By the way, that term is already going into disuse for the silent generation elders. No one calls them senior citizens. You ever notice that? People in their 70s, it's going out of use. This is according to AARP poll. The silent don't think of themselves as senior citizens. They didn't win World War II. They didn't build the A-bomb, you know, those things that make you that kind of citizen. You, we have to think of something better for the silent, something more personal, something like senior partner, you know, or something, <laughs> old bopper, or something like that. But with the, with the boomers, that'll be gone entirely. No one's going to call uh, boomers senior citizens. Uh, heck, we may not, they may not even be on the ballot for the presidency this, uh, this fall. Think about it. We may have an exer versus a silent. It'd be unbelievable, this whole phase of life, just be, the American voters deciding enough. We don't want any more of that generation. So, <laughs> so in terms of politics, they're going to be very weak. But we've seen generations like this before in our history. We've gone back centuries. We've looked at generations. We've looked at the patterns and rhythms that they have. We've seen generations like that who are constantly reshaping values in the culture and constantly looked to by other generations for what they have to offer here. And so we predict that, you know, eventually, well, boomers, they're still going to be writing those op-ed pieces in the newspapers. They're still going to be screaming at each other on talk radio even into their 80s. It's, it's not going to be a pretty picture. <laughs> and they're still going to be playing those 1,200 golden oldies until the last boomer dies. And then at, at that point, Gen X is going to have a bonfire of celebration. Right. <clears throat> Generational surprise, it hit in the mid-1960s. Notice again, no one predicted this surprise. Not Margaret Mead, not Eric Erickson, none of the great social scientists at the time. They had no idea it was coming. This youth explosion was coming. They should have had they been looking at generational location in life, but they weren't. Impact on education? Well, of course, they famously rejected the system in an era of social turmoil, youth anger, and worsening outcomes. And I like to mention this because when boomers ever talk, start talking about the behavior of kids, 
today. It's worth remembering that almost every measure of youth dysfunction got much worse from first cohort to last as boomers were kids. The, almost the entire SAT score decline was from first to last boomers. Crime rate got worse. Of that crime, the share that was violence, suicide, self-inflicted accidents, teen pregnancy. I mean, you can go through all of them. They all got much worse from first cohort to last. Just keep that in mind. Tuck that fact away for a second. Uh, to boomers, high school diploma is still necessary, but no longer, it's no longer, not only sufficient, it was no longer valued because it's a badge that you're in the system, and no boomer wants to brag about that. So you still have your high school diploma, you had to get it, but maybe you just put it in the drawer rather than on the wall. You know, you never know about a boomer. He's not necessarily going to advertise that.